Hey, welcome to the Total Connector Show. I'm the host of the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. And I'm really excited to look forward to have Parker Lewis from Unchained Capital back on my show again. And he's written a, a marvelous article uh, uh, within the article series Bitcoin Gradual Then Suddenly. The title of, the, of his latest article is Bitcoin is anti-fragile. There's even an audio version to it right at the top. And um, yeah, check it out, read it. Uh, we're going to talk about a lot of stuff about you know randomness and uh, stressors, volatility, uh, decentralization, trust, trustlessness, the legacy monetary system or the central banking kleptocratic system. Um, so we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff, um, uh, trying you know connect dots. You know, understanding, comprehending the bigger picture. And yeah, let me know your questions afterwards. Hope you're going to enjoy this as much as I do. And um, please give me a follow, give it a like, reshare, retweet, whatever you do. Thanks so much for your support, for listening. And without further ado, this is my talk with Parker Lewis from Unchained Capital. Wait, can you? Uh, yeah. Can you go live? Can you? Can you live? Yeah. Yeah, I can hear you. All okay. right. Okay. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Welcome to the show, Parker. Thanks so much for your time. <laughs> yeah. Looking you wrote a beautiful masterpiece, huh? I said, looking forward to the conversation. Yeah, definitely. It's a really masterpiece. It's um, again, uh, Parker Lewis is um, at Unchained Capital, um, and you wrote another masterpiece. It's called Bitcoin. It's anti-fragile. Uh, within the series of your articles, Bitcoin gradually then suddenly. Now, uh, Parker, before we go on, what, what is, what I'm curious about, like, what was like the aha moment or like the enlightening moment where you said, okay, I got to write something about anti-fragility. What's the, what was your thought process? Um, I think it was probably one of a big, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of Taleb, um, and I, think, you know, I, I've, in, in certain of my prior writings, I've talked about the, the minority rule, which I think is something that uh, applies significantly to Bitcoin or um, kind of it, it's something that, that translates and is very obvious. And then, um, you know, kind of red skin the game, red, red anti-fragile by Taleb. Uh, back when I wrote uh, Ender's Game. I had read the block, the Black Sox Swan of Cairo, uh, which is another one of those pieces, which is more talking about kind of uh, political or social kind of volatility. But uh, a lot of those ideas, you know, had been kind of familiar to me. And the more that I came around to Bitcoin, it was really this idea. That I would say there was an aha moment. I kind of, I think I've known I wanted to write about the idea of anti-fragility a lot. But then when Bitcoin crashed to 4,000 in March and everyone was kind of in a panic and then seeing it recover. And um, it was that idea that was, you know, th this isn't actually a bad thing for Bitcoin. You know, this isn't singular, singularly anti-fragility, but this is how Bitcoin becomes stronger because it is just entirely out in the wild and everybody has to figure it out. And, um, you know, I think it's Antonopoulos who, who made the comment of, you know, a bubble boy versus, you know, um, a swamp rat. Um, and, and when you see, when you think about everybody in Bitcoin having to live through March 12th, where no one's being rescued and you just have to figure it out, it kind of starts to connect that, oh, that system over time is going to be a lot more resilient and those individuals that are exposed to the elements are going to be um, far better at it, at adapting. And then when you think about Bitcoin as a structure and as a system and how it's constructed, that, you know, there, there are, you know, many different things or systems that you could describe as, you know, within the spectrum of anti-fragility. But I think that one of the things that sets Bitcoin apart is really the just how you know it is quintessential anti-fragility um and that it's just just uh, uh, some some people refer to it as uh, as an apex predator 
or as the honey badger, but it just, it literally just every single thing that you throw at it, it just turns around and makes, you know, immunizes and then makes the system better. So it's an idea or concept I've been thinking about for a while, um, but, but then really what, what happened in March and the volatility and, and, and helping people understand, I wrote about it, I kind of teased it in a piece where I wrote Bitcoin is a rally cry, talking about it was early in the Fed's kind of returning on QE or more aggressively. And then, uh, and so I had known for a couple months that I wanted to write about it. Um, but, uh, but that was probably the, the thing that said, okay, you know, now or in the next few months, let's do this. Mm -hmm. Somewhere, somewhere in your article, you write about, um, you, you compare it, uh, just in the short sense, like with the organic, I'm not sure, maybe I'm just paraphrasing and putting, we don't want to put words in your mouth, like, uh, uh like organic living being. And I remember Andreas Antonopoulos even talked about like Bitcoin and said, you know, it's like a child in its early stages, uh, maybe pr probably paraphrasing that too, like growing up in a mud and then, you know, as it, as it grows up, this child, it becomes more and more immune or whatever, resilient, more robust, more, you know, more just anti-fragile, you know, it's like becoming really strong and stronger. Now, you know, I've been thinking like we in the Bitcoin community, Bitcoin space, I've been thinking a lot, like how can we translate, you know, especially also your articles or your knowledge, um, not only within this eco chamber, um, of Bitcoin, but like to the 99% out there. Now you talk about, you know, stressors, volatility, randomness, uh, and well, you know, all these kinds of words within the context of anti-fragility. Do you want to break this down a little bit for the 99% out there? Sure. So, you know, I, th I think that you know, if you summed all of those up, maybe it would just be, and you mentioned it talking about Antonopoulos's comment, but things that things that just when exposed to the element elements, they that you know kind of there being a difference, and this is this is the idea of anti fertility that that Nassim Taleb discusses, saying um, that you know just like if you think about things that are resilient, um, that that isn't actually the opposite of something that is fragile. So if you if you were to think of something as fragile, say it's you know, a coffee mug, and if the coffee mug fell on the ground, it would break and shatter and not the end of the world, you'll get another coffee mug, but the coffee mug is inherently, inherently fragile. Um, and then there's certain, certain things that, that are uh, inherently resilient, um, that, um, you know, like thinking off the top of my head, um, you know, like a, a large company may be resilient, you know, um, the, the the virus happens and you know it, it it survives it you know it doesn't fundamentally change maybe they change certain you know there, there's probably aspects of anti-fragility where um you know, the, people may change certain processes and companies may become better as a result other companies will fail um, but then really when when you think about the inputs is if exposed to the elements does does a system and how it's constructed actually gain strength rather than just merely be able, I kind of think about it as like, can you take a punch or is there something about act, the process of actually taking a punch that makes the system stronger? And so when you, when, you know, kind of the ideas that I highlight specifically that you mentioned are um, disorder, stressors, volatility, and randomness. And so if I was to walk through each of them very quickly, you know, one I would, you know, again, suggest people read the piece, but with disorder, it's, you know, in, in Bitcoin, there really is a spontaneous order that has emerged. Um, you know, I don't like to think of it as CODA's law because it, it really is much um, bigger than that in terms of like, there aren't just 21 million Bitcoin because software code says it is. There's 21 million Bitcoin because there is a network with proper incentives and everybody is enforcing rules against everybody. That is the spontaneous order. It only works because of decentralization. That uh, because nobody can coordinate and because the network is spawning and becoming more and more decentralized, everybody can trust the network because the network is trustless. Um, and it wouldn't be trustless if not for social disorder. Um, and that social disorder is underpinned by decentralization. So you know, kind of, if I think about that in relation to anti-fragility, it is, you know, several years ago, 
various people from the outside world tried to change the Bitcoin network. And now it wasn't a change to the, uh, say, to, to, to make 22 million or 23 million Bitcoin, but it would have shown that Bitcoin was changeable or capable of being influenced by an outside force. And in my view, I would say if that fact happened or if the network was capable of being changed by a group of companies, then maybe the first change wasn't the money supply, but the next change, you know, or the change down the road would have been. So disorder, whenever, you know, whenever the, the Bitcoin network is either suggested to, to be influenced or um, whether there's an attempt to, to you know, kind of from the outside to, to change the rules, it, just, it doesn't just stay the same. People learn more about Bitcoin and, and understand that, um, and, and it's oftentimes that you can't know within Bitcoin whether Bitcoin is resistant to a certain type of attack until the attack is actually attempted. And, and Bitcoin fend, you know, fends off that attack. But again, it's not static. People then look at that and, and recognize and confidence increases, which causes adoption to increase, which makes the network more decentralized, which strengthens the, the immune system. So that's, that, that would be disorder. Um, stressors, I think this one's an obvious one, but it's you know, just, just the little things that, um, if, you, if you were thinking about your own body, if you were, and this is again, going back to Antonopoulos, but if you're a bubble boy and you weren't ever exposed to, to anything that, you know, like any allergen or any sickness, and then you went out into the world of sickness and allergies, you, you likely wouldn't survive. Um, and that, you know, the idea of stressors and, and how that connects with anti-fragility or, or Bitcoin being an anti-fragile system is that like, I, I probably best compare it with the, the legacy financial system and, and, and kind of keying back to, to March where there was significant volatility in Bitcoin, but there was no one there to, to bail Bitcoin out or bail anybody out. And I'll, I'll talk about this same concept as it relates to volatility because it's, it, it's, you know, for an independent reason, also kind of one of the classifications, but that every little thing that happens within Bitcoin, Bitcoin is, I would say, you know, not living in the sense that a human being is living, but is constantly adapting. It's not static. And because everybody, you know, more and more people are adopting Bitcoin every single day, people are having to solve problems or experiencing problems. And that when negative events happen, somebody's Coinbase accounts gets, gets hacked, or um, a, a Bitcoin exchange gets hacked, that those are small little stressors that impact people on the edge of the network, where volatility that happens impacts everybody within the network. And we all have to, we all have to constantly evolve. Yeah, so here, you know, here on the screen, if, for those who are watching, you can see a list of stressors. But basically, it's just by, by constantly exposing Bitcoin to small amounts of stress, it basically ensures that there isn't a systemic or critical risk that could cause the network to fail. Um, and then on volatility itself, more functionally, it is, you know, when the price of Bitcoin rises and falls, oftentimes people look at that and say, you know, Bitcoin can't be money because that's, you know, me seeing the price of my money change day to day isn't how money works. But more realistically, the volatility actually causes Bitcoin to strengthen. I would say, if you think about the legacy financial system, it is that every, when we saw the stock market start to crash in March, the Fed bailed it out. And the Fed bailed it out at the, at the consequence, ultimately, of the underlying currency and the viability of the underlying currency. And it has done that, you know, consistently over the last 10 years, practically speaking, consistently over the last 40 years. And it, what it's essentially doing is it's, it's weakening the immune system of the legacy financial system. It's basically you know, training and creating moral hazard for all the participants within that economy that say, I don't have to be sharp and I don't have to really make sure I'm appropriately understanding the risk that I'm taking and pricing risk because the Fed's going to bail me out. Um, and the, the consequence of that is, you know, kind of, you're not having stressors, you're not having volatility, you're not having people constantly sharpen and, and 
price risk and price an asset and having true price discovery. And, and ultimately what you have in that world is you, you have short-term stability and then you have imbalances accumulate and for ultimately a fragility in a system uh, present itself or grow. In Bitcoin, you have the opposite. You have extreme volatility during periods of time that actually strengthens Bitcoin's immune system because not only do everybody within the network or not everyone does everybody in, with, within the network have to adjust to it and, and you know, be accountable to that and manage around it, but that, that vol mere nature of volatility is actually when Bitcoin, the most Bitcoin gets distributed and Bitcoin grows in those periods. Um, either the price is crashing, people who've been paying attention to Bitcoin finally take the opportunity to, to buy it, or as the price goes up, people who've held Bitcoin for a long time transfer it and Bitcoin becomes more decentralized. Um, and then the last one is just randomness. Recognizing that, and this one's probably the hardest one to describe, but um, you know, within a, you know, if you, if, you th if you would think about the org structure of a, of a company, and it's not to say that companies can't have anti-fragility and the, probably the best ones that adapt the best have some sense of or semblance of an anti-fragile system. But if you think about a company that's heavily top-down managed by, a, say, a CEO, and that CEO is picking every single person that comes into the company, um, inherently you're going to have less randomness uh, in, in that world. And that in Bitcoin, because it is decentralized, and it's not to say that that company can't be successful, but there's just limits to the uh, the capability of it, of any individual mind um, or any any individual period. And that in a in a system like Bitcoin, because it is decentralized, it is subject to high degrees of randomness, and you ultimately have more uh, not not necessarily diverse. You just have more mind share and more people looking at the problem in different ways. And then you have people taking different actions to solve different problems in a completely organic and unpredictable way. And that as a result of that, you're naturally going to get a more resilient and um, not just a, a, you know, kind of statically, okay, a, a very strong system is that with each passing blow that the network takes, anybody can pick up a shovel and fix the problem. And when you live in a world like that on a permissionless basis, um, you know, not just the amount of creativity, but your ability to actually solve problems uh, increases exponentially as the number of people that are contributing increases. So, um, yeah, that was probably a little long rambling, but but you know, think I, I I would say to people, think about their like daily lives and see whether or not you know when, when exposed to the element and when exposed to randomness and volatility, whether somebody is actually strengthening because certain people are, certain people aren't, certain companies are, certain companies aren't. And then when you think about the financial system, the financial system is by definition weakened each time um, the Fed injects money to essentially bail out um, the, you know, kind of on a short term basis to bail out the, the, the economic system and Bitcoin is quite the opposite. Mm -hmm. You mentioned it already. Um, the sort of the comparison between the, you know, the central banking fiat legacy system and Bitcoin. So you already said it, but maybe you could, you could just emphasize or, or, or go a little bit into detail. Like, so the central banks, uh, while the central banks are, you know, printing with their physically, digitally trillions and trillions and, um, and bringing so much uh, instability actually long-term is that, automatically helping uh, the, you know, boosting the anti-fragility and the trust, uh, uh, you know, of people into the um, <laughs> trustlessness and decentralized nature of Bitcoin more and more. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, are there second order effects through that? Like, uh, for example, I heard Max Kaiser talk about uh, whatever it was it Iran or some other country like uh, now gaining more and more hash rates or substantial hash rate would that be sort of a second order effect because now after 12 years or 11 or 12 years there's been uh, you know the anti-fragility has just proven itself now to, to everybody now you know not only to individuals but now to nation states to governments uh, does my question make sense yeah yeah I, th I think so I, so I think at the highest level, the way that I would describe it is that 
So one, on, on the one hand, you have an inherently fragile system, the legacy financial system. So that I like to pick on the Fed because I, um, I live in the United States and I'm most familiar with it. And there's probably the access to the most information that's in English that I can actually read. Um, and but in, in the, the, the measures that the Fed have taken in the last you know, 90 days have been far more extreme than any central bank in the, in the world. So it's, it's the most relevant thing to talk to. But each, you know, the important thing is each fiat system within each country is fundamentally the same. Certain countries may ultimately have you know, more gold in their reserves on a relative basis and have less, less debt that they owe. But all fiat monies are inherently the same. And the cost to produce any fiat money is marginally zero. And that is the key source of fragility to the system because, uh, and our, our friend Michael Goldstein said, or he put out a tweet you know, a year ago or two years ago. It's like, if they can print money, they will print money. And the money printing is, or the digital creation of money via quantitative easing really is the source of all fragility. It's, it's, you know, kind of the breakdown first of the money, but then ultimately of the pricing mechanism of the money. And, you know, the, the more people that figure that out, the more that will opt out. And so when you think about each, each individual fiat monetary system being inherently fragile for that reason, competing against an anti-fragile system. And so if you think about it, whether it's Iran or, uh, Russia or China or the US or Europe or you know, Western yeah. Europe, South America, thinking about each one of the, within each local economy, that each has a, a structurally weak and weakening fiat system. And then you have an emergent anti-fragile system being Bitcoin and that that isn't, like neither of those two systems, you know, in their respective local economies are living in a vacuum. They, it's dynamic. So it's actually as Bitcoin, if, if you were to think about Bitcoin's anti-fragility and it's constantly evolving and strengthening its, of its immune system and, and becoming stronger and stronger over time, it's gaining that strength. Again, you may not be able to measure it on an individual by individual basis, but it's gaining that strength at the cost of the legacy system. So it's like as Bitcoin is absorbing and becoming stronger, that that fact is weakening the legacy system. And so I, I do think that it, first and foremost, it is a dynamic relationship. I think separately, because you, know, you asked about second order effects, there certainly are second order and third order effects. I think the first order effect of the Fed doing what it did in March, April, May, continuing to this day, ECB is doing the same thing, the BOJ is doing the same thing, maybe not to um, as extreme of circumstances, but that each one of those is fundament, each one of those central banks is fundamentally taking the same action. And they're on the front end, there's just a sticker shock, which is people, you know, ripping the band-aid off and saying, okay, enough enough is enough. This doesn't make sense. I've been hearing about this thing, Bitcoin. I'm gonna go learn more because this sounds crazy. But then there's also, you know, the, the I'd say a second order effect, which is actually that money moving through the economy because the, the the first time that the fed prints a trillion dollars and then two trillion and then three trillion the the actual effect is transmitted longer term through the credit system so the first is the the mental kind of connection that is made the second is the actual monetary flow and then i think the third is how broadly you know maybe either geopolitics or large nation states respond to either the dollar, euro, yen. So I think it is both, you know, there, there are multiple orders of effects, but then also I think more importantly, even that because they are two competing systems, the, the strengthening of one is weakening the other. And with each one of these moves by central banks, it's kind of, it's like where, you know, you're going to be checkmated in five moves. They don't, but we do. Um, and each one, each episode kind of contributes just closer and closer to the end game. Mm -hmm. 
Um, there's a question that uh, popped up again. <laughs> Sorry if I uh, sound like a broken record, but I know I asked you now two or three times. You still think negative rates are impossible? Well, I don't think that negative rates are impossible. I think that in the United States, that there is something psychological about like people in the United States know that it's crazy and that that is the point like they have to normalize it hard and go out and, and you know essentially win the public opinion that that's okay before it can ever happen and um, and they're not even close to that so I would say I, I recognize that it's a possibility you know before quantitative easing, people would have said, no, the Fed can't print a trillion dollars in a year. And now when they've printed $3 trillion, everyone says it's crazy, but it was necessary. What else were they going to do? Um, so I'm, I'm recognizing that at some point, some crazy lunatic in the United States that works for the Federal Reserve will convince the other idiots that negative interest rates are correct. I'm just saying that I think in the next, 12 months, 24 months, that it's much more likely that the Fed takes direct measures to continue to accelerate quantitative easing and also at the same time do what they have to do to ensure that interest rates don't go negative. Because negative interest rates are the thing that even for another, for an otherwise person that is in that that has some common sense that is otherwise in a trance and lulled to sleep by the Fed. There's something magical about going from zero to negative where someone says, wait, so I have to lend you my money and I have to pay you. And the the best you have to do is give me back less money. And I take your counterparty risk. That that just fundamentally doesn't make sense. And so it, there, while there's nothing functionally different about an interest rate of effectively 0.1% and negative 15 basis points, it's crossing over that, that zero threshold where again, incrementally, everyone is going to understand that it's all a charade. Um, and, and the common sense people are going to, you know, kind of increasingly or probably in an accelerated way throw their hands up. So yes, probably will happen at some point, but there, you know, where public perception is and, and, and their inability to explain how it makes sense or that it's not batshit crazy um, hasn't yet been achieved. So, you know, they've, they've sent basically um, trial balloons out and everybody collectively have been like, no, this is batshit crazy. Do you not, do you not see why? Um, so eventually it will probably happen as, you know, the last gasp of the financial system. But I would expect in the next one to two years that we're seeing, you know, trillions more money created and the Fed taking more direct action to ensure that the even short-term rates remain positive. And there's a lot that they can do to manipulate that market to make sure that market forces don't send it negatively. Mm. I can imagine, you know, like Powell going into 60 minutes again and saying, you know, that's what we do, you know, we do negative rates, you know, so it's like the most natural thing to do. So, you know, your article series is called Bitcoin Gradually Suddenly. And I'm, I'm more interested, like, what is like the, the tipping point, what, what, what's like, when does the straw like break? What, what, what needs to happen like to have this, uh, because it's gone, it, you know, essentially if, as you're writing about anti-fragility, I think this, this will like by order of magnitude, like increase the, you know, the trust of, of individuals, of people, of, of institutions more and more, or even, you know, competing nation states uh, going full blown into, into Bitcoin uh, as it's happening actually already in the mining business. What, what's your take on that? Well, I would, I would think about, or at least as I think about timing and end games, I think if we were thinking fundamentally, the legacy systems won't have probably a critical failure point until 
a critical mass of people don't need the dollar system or the euro system or the yen system. So from a practical perspective, there has to be enough Bitcoin adoption density within certain localized economies where you know, cause, cause ultimately what you, what you have is there are a lot of people because of the structure of the credit system that must demand dollars, that must demand euros, that must depend yet, demand yen. And that is a function of the credit system. Dollar denominated credit, euro denominated credit, yen denominated credit. Each one of those represents future demand for each of those currencies. And so while, uh, and I think this is something that is hard for people to understand, but all the while the Fed is printing $3 trillion, credit is tight, liquidity is tight, um, and that is because there are far more uh, you know, liabilities in the system and credit in the system than, than there are actual dollars. And so, um, but what, what's also happening at that same time is that despite the fact that the system is massively levered, individuals within that system, you know, kind of, or, or there are individuals within that system that are not. And so you have to get to a world where enough people are converted over to Bitcoin where they no longer have to demand those dollars or euros or yen. And, and probably from, a, you know, just from a reality, and this is again, one of those things when you think about two competing economic systems and monetary systems, the more productive people and the least indebted are going to be moving over to Bitcoin. And the, and so the, the, the legacy systems are going to have a negative selection problem where the least productive, most indebted are going to, to, to be tied to and wed to the legacy system. And that the consequence of that is that, you know, it could happen quicker, but, but that's, how I, that's all how I ultimately think about it. You have, if, if only two or 3% of people in the world today have, um, have adopted Bitcoin, maybe it's, maybe it's higher than that by now. But, uh, you know, there is no silver bullet of what, a, what does a critical mass mean? Um, but, you know, it likely needs to be more than 10% of a population, maybe 20% or 30%. Um, and that could also happen in a cycle um, or in a cycle or two. And I, and I also kind of often bring up the fact that, again, these things aren't happening in a vacuum. So Bitcoin would be a superior monetary system to the, to the Fed and the ECB and the BOJ, even if they weren't printing trillions of dollars, euros and yen, but they are. And that if I look out into the future, it's hard to imagine that Bitcoin could have two more halvening cycles. And knowing that the Fed and, and all these central banks are going to be printing trillions more dollars, that within 10 years, and just knowing how knowledge distributes and knowing about how the pace of Bitcoin development is working again, Bitcoin development at the protocol level or kind of base layer, very slow, but the amount of development that's going on on top of Bitcoin is very fast. The rate at which knowledge is distributing is very fast. And we're, you know, kind of looking out into the future, again, if I was forecasting 10 years to, you know, kind of practically two, or yeah, two Bitcoin um, happening schedules. So the, the, the rate of increase would be um, what you know, far less than one percent, and at a time when the because of the construct of the financial system and the leverage, the the Fed and the ECB and the BOJ, every single central bank everywhere is going to be going in the opposite direction. That it's hard for me to see. You know, people probably think it's crazy when I say you know, um, Bitcoin could be the global reserve currency within ten years. But you think of all of those dynamics together it's actually harder for me to believe that that's not the case than it is the case. So exactly. I think it's, it's more probabilistic um, and more rational, I would say, and less crazy than, than the other opinion. Yeah, I think that's the challenge for most people. Um, understanding, you know, the, the totality of the dynamics, how they interplay with one another. And again, you know, it comes back to trust. Um, you, you know, you talk about trust in your article. You, you also talk now about trust. So if more and more people 
let's say suddenly, you know, lose trust or a critical mass lose trust in the legacy or the dollar as the international reserve currency, as whatever, as the medium exchange, as store of value, then they, what if, you know, what if a, a critical mass of merchants, businesses, this is, again, this is my real, my real aspiration that more and more merchants start at least preparing themselves for this transition phase. And I think that could happen faster than we could even anticipate, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so I, I, I do think that on, on, one, on one side, it's kind of how do people react uh, in, in a, out of necessity versus how do they react when they have the benefit of you know, not, not having their hand forced. So I think, and, 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 and part of that's just dictated by you know, wh where and when um, and, and how far out something happens. So you know, again, uh, I think it's easy for people to sit in their kind of ivory towers and look at Venezuela and say, shit, like you, you need, <laughs> you need Bitcoin. Like, why isn't everybody just adopting Bitcoin today? And it's like, oh, because they need like food today. And that they're, they're not sitting in comfortable, you know, homes. They can read all day about Bitcoin. You know, there's more pressing matters in their lives. Um, and yes, Bitcoin will be a long-term solution, but the, the economy has deteriorated to such an extent where that it actually uh, inhibits uh, in mass or quickly the adoption of Bitcoin. Um, and so I think that there is some relationship between the more people that are already plugged into Bitcoin and that understand something about it, that when confidence does break suddenly in a currency again, because I, if you, you know, or you can obviously see when a currency, when it's done. Like if you look at the Argentine peso, like it, it's done. It's not the Venezuelan Bolivar yet, but confidence was broken and you can't put that back in the back um and and, and you and you can never like once confidence breaks in a currency it's gone um and so i think that it will naturally force people to bitcoin but if people in the you know the united states and europe and it's four years from now and they've all had a chance you know in a in a fairly robust way to so at least be knowledgeable about Bitcoin or know people, you know, at least one or two hops away that, that could help them, that, when, you know, there, there just very naturally is like the currency collapse, the fiat system, like it is gradual. And then it, it does happen suddenly, like there will be a break. Uh, it doesn't mean that it goes from stable to Venezuela in, in a night, but there will be over a, period of a week or a month, knowing when the confidence in that currency breaks and where, and, and, and the point of no return essentially. And at that moment, you know, people will in a more accelerated way, go find and seek out Bitcoin from a practical perspective. And I kind of, I, I try to walk a tightrope here. The legacy system is going to fail on its own weight, but Bitcoin will accelerate it because it's a better system and it will be Steal, you know, essentially winning over resources. So I think, you know, one positive of it is that the fiat system hopefully doesn't break until a critical mass of people have Bitcoin, but that actually a critical mass of people having Bitcoin could actually break the fiat system. So um, it just kind of depends on the path to which we get there. And, and, you know, kind of, I, in my view, the longer out that, that, ultimate shift can happen, the more people we can gradually get onto Bitcoin, the, the less that, that pain it, or the, the, you know, the amount of pain that will ultimately be felt. Um, so I think you know, it is natural that over time more and more merchants will, will adopt it and that should currencies become destable in, in larger countries, that the rate of that adoption shift you know, will, will certainly accelerate. But you, know, you, you also have to be conscious that there's a reason why everybody's not just moved over and understanding Bitcoin. It still is something that is intangible. It's abstract. It may be intuitive to a number of us who've just 
you know, been Bitcoin all day, every day for a while. Um, but, but also, you know, kind of there, th those two dynamics do exist. Out of necessity, you expect people to just say, okay, well, screw it. I don't know how Bitcoin works, but it works. Uh, but then at the same time, if you're, if you're doing that in a climate that is experiencing significant economic deterioration, there's a reality that you literally don't need money as much as you do things to consume in the present. You can't plan and, or you, you, you can't have as low of a time preference as you otherwise would if you already had a reliable money. So I think it's, it's a dynamic equation. Um, Parker, let me ask you, man, every child, if I think can understand when, when the stock market like goes on a trajectory like up and up and up and companies like Hertz that I think that's never been done before. It's like a bank or a company issuing, issuing bonds or right. And I mean, going from what well, 50 cent, what was that? Or issuing stocks? I think it was, I think it was issuing stock in bankruptcy stock. without, yeah, very odd. So what's, I mean, how, because once that uh, once the Pandora's box has been opened already, they they have to keep printing right and and pumping the stock market. There is no way back. So uh, this is when really <laughs> like what is what is the rationale behind this? Well, I think first you have to everyone has to admit that there's nothing fundamentally different about this market than there was about two thousand eight. And so while there is no going back, uh, it, you know, again, the, the moment in time when somebody wakes up and when, when I'm, I guess when I mean somebody, I mean like collectively a critical mass of people wake up and say that this doesn't make sense and it can't go on. That, that timing is impossible to predict. There's the saying markets can remain irrational for longer than you can remain solvent. Um, and that, you know, the Fed, essentially what they're doing right now, while they are implicitly ta targeting the stock market, they, they have to sustain the size of the credit system. And, and that's the most important pe point for people to take away. They will put dollars in the system, even though you can think of them as saying, you know, wanting the S&P to be at a certain level, that's really not it. They know that if they if they can stabilize asset prices and stabilize current debt levels and put the dollars in the system that they need to accomplish that, that yes, there will be more dollars in the system with more dollars in the system, all dollar financial assets will be more, quote, quote, worth more in dollar terms. But, but, that is, but that is actually what they are targeting for in that, that it can go, essentially it can go on for as long until it can't. Um, and I think that in my world, it's honestly not worth trying to predict when or how. It's basically trade through that, you know, um, and that the best way to do that is to opt out. Um, because I think that if you, you know, there's a lot of focus in the stock market can go up or down and just think about all the, all the mental energy that goes into like what the F the Fed's going to do. And I just, just keep, you know, storing my money or my value in a better form of money and you don't have to think about it you can actually be productive and and um and if i'm convinced well i'm not convinced we'll, we'll have to put it up on our website or do something but uh, it doesn't matter if the s p 500 goes up it doesn't matter if the dow jones goes up if you are pricing it in bitcoin terms it's going to be going down um and so if you are psychologically like thinking oh is it going to go up or down it's it's that the you are missing the point that trillions of dollars are being created and it's, and you're, you're on the, you're, you're part of the game of musical chairs. If you're trying to still optimize for dollars when each dollar is becoming worth less and less and that the currency system as a mere function of those central banking actions will entirely fall apart. So, you know, I think play stupid games, win stupid prizes type of, uh, of a, you know, kind of environment, and that if, if you again go down to that root level consequence or kind of structural question, it would say, yeah, and, and this comes back to some of the what I wrote in Bitcoin is anti fragile. This idea that Bitcoin is like people view it as risky, 
uh, and more practically not because Bitcoin could fail. I, I, I honestly believe that we're past that point now is that not owning Bitcoin is the risky position because you're going to need a stable form of money and your your money speaking to, to the 98 percent of people that don't have bitcoin is inherently fragile and and risky and then everything that's built on top of that the stock market the credit market like if your wealth advisor has you 60 percent in stocks and 40 percent 39 percent in bonds and one percent in cash like you have a massive risk problem and that that bitcoin isn't risky you're thinking of it as risky because it's volatile and associating probably evil, mischaracterizing or misunderstanding the difference between volatility and risk. Um, and also then uh, kind of misunderstanding the, the construction of, of the system, how Bitcoin works, because even though it's young, you're, you're associating that with fragile and it's quite the opposite. So um, I personally, you know, again, not financial advice, but I have zero exposure to the U.S. stock market or any stock. Market. Right, right. Uh, unless, unless you are, uh, unless it's uh, uh, based on the Cantillon effect, you are really closely connected to the federal, uh, you know, reserve system, right? I mean, then you don't have to worry. Yeah, about I mean, but your 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 business is going to collapse in the future. So, it, you know, the, yeah, can you can you extract some short term gain and convert it over to Bitcoin to then be able to survive first users? You know, certain people will, but you know, um, the the aggregate of that system is going to lose. So, if you're playing probabilities, the the sooner the sooner that you are off the hamster wheel, the better. Do you think, uh, you just mentioned that, do you think uh, some institutions will, because that's as actually what Preston Pish also did in, in an interview, like he read like the, the calculations like denominated in Bitcoin and in, in, in dollar, you know, and do you think institutions going to start doing that? I mean, for the sake of transparency or, uh, you know, honesty or, you know, towards their, you know, their stockholders like you know this is this is like the, a transparent system like how do you evaluate it you know how do you evaluate your your company your earnings whatever no i don't think so i mean i think that for as long as you know until bitcoin overtakes the dollar which again i do think like again sounds crazy it's not the the more logical position is that that happens. Um, that, but until it happens, people will be thinking of Bitcoin in dollar terms, even if kind of, even if at a very deep level as Bitcoin is being volatile and going through price discovery, it, it's hard to see, but each person is starting to price Bitcoin and, 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 and it, it's typically seen through some fiat currency pair, but they're also, more importantly, pricing their own value and how much of, of, of their value is stored in one medium versus another. And so, but more practically speaking, I don't think that that, you know, everyone very much is in th things of ter considering or, you know, evaluating purchasing power, it is anchored to a fiat currency. So, so like, while I'm accumulating Bitcoin not to get more dollars, the best expression of my Bitcoin's purchasing power for other goods is still the dollar. Um, and, I, and I don't think that that will change. I think increasingly people will benchmark to Bitcoin and that as people do, they will learn something about the two currency and economic systems. Um, but I don't think that you know, companies that are managing stock portfolios on behalf of clients will start to, to show them you know, in Bitcoin denominated terms, somebody's going to see it on a page and be like, the bit quote, the Bitcoin is up, you know, a thousand percent and my stock, you know, dividends are 2% and they're going to figure it out. But, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, the stock is traded in dollars, you know, and I think that there it's, it's more likely that there is a uh, like an oil contract that's settled in in Bitcoin 
before there is any major stock that's 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 issued or traded in Bitcoin. Um, because if you think about that, they're like, yeah, stock exchange, you know, people are actually trading dollars for the stock. You know, there's not a direct um, market that connects Bitcoin to stocks or companies that are, you know, once a company is issuing shares and, you know, raising it in Bitcoin and that there's an exchange that's trading those company sh shares. And I'm, talk I'm not talking about like a, a, an ICO company. I'm talking about like a real company that has real assets that does something productive in the world. That until there's um, tradable markets where companies' shares are actually traded and settled in Bitcoin, that prices will still be denominated and, and um, communicated for, for, for a good reason. Again, you can't directly trade them for Bitcoin, but, but I think people will make those connections and more people will start, you know, like for people have showed the price of the S&P in, in, in terms of gold or an ounce of gold and, and people will increasingly do that in Bitcoin. I think it will, it will be more impactful, um, but, uh, but then eventually everything will become denominated in Bitcoin. Wow. Mark, thank you so much. We're fantastic. I really enjoyed that. Um, so your article uh, can only urge my listeners and viewers to uh, read for themselves. It's uh, on unchainedcapital.com. I'm going to put it in the show notes. It's Bitcoin is anti-fragile and people can find you on Parker Lewis at Parker Lewis on Twitter. So Parker, thank you so much. Uh, hope, I look forward to your next article. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, if you got any ideas, let me know. I always enjoy the, uh, spoke at the Value of Bitcoin conference a couple times in the yeah. last few months, but I, I always enjoy speaking with you. So thanks for having me on and look forward to coming back on in the future. All right, bud. Okay, take care. Thanks so All much. All right, see you.